Hi, Sister Roma. Hello, my love. How are you? Oh, well, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing about as well as I think we all can be. How about yourself? I'm good. You know, I've been surprisingly busy. I mean, especially for someone who hasn't left their house in like, you know, three months. March, April, May, June, four months. Hardly. Well, you look fabulous and so does the Bay Area. I love seeing it behind you. Yeah, in case there's any question, I am from San Francisco. Boom, there you have it. All right, so times are crazy. Uh, could you tell us if you've done anything this past week that you're proud of? Oh, absolutely. Actually, just last weekend, I hosted San Francisco Virtual Pride. So it was the fourth year in a row that Honey Mahogany and I have hosted Pride together. And usually, you know, we're on stage at Civic Center, downtown San Francisco with like 10,000 people. But this year we had to make changes like everybody has and we did it virtually, but they really turned it out. Like they recreated the San Francisco Pride stage with City Hall in the background and made this most immersive, amazing experience. I did have to actually go to the studio to film it. So that was one of the rare times that I've left. I've only left the house really to go do that and to go do demonstrations for things that I think are important. I love that uh, sisters are getting the opportunity to go to a studio and to participate in these virtual immersive uh, showcases and my, uh, secular profession. I'm a lighting designer. So I've been watching as these companies have churned out like how to have your trade show, how to have your fundraiser. Do you want a graduation? Come and walk in front of this green screen and we'll recreate the whole thing digitally. And I'm like, well, I never have to leave my house again. I know. That's the other thing that's been really interesting is I never thought that I, I never wanted to work from home. <clears throat> it was sort of something that we talked about because I work, you know, in porn and it's an online company. I'm the creative director. And I was like, if I ever say I'm working from home, I'm not. Like I would, I just didn't think I would do it. And then right when all this happened, like the middle of March, luckily Tim Valenti, my boss and the president was on top of it. And he got all of it set up with everything we need to work from home. So we're all working remotely and it's turned out to be a really, really great experience. Now, are the entertainers generating new content? Are you working off of footage that you've already canned or is that something that you can't divulge? Like what's in the sauce? No, it's both. We luckily had quite a few things that we had already filmed that we were going to release as normal through the summer. And then we've got really creative. We found guys who are quarantined together, roommates, lovers, boyfriends, and we're creating new material with them. And then we're doing some really interesting stuff like this with online video chats and things were like they're they're having a corporate meeting and all of a sudden somebody zoom bombs it and it turns into this big like sexual thing we've had game shows like they're it's, it's just been really really fun to come up with new ways to create content during this time i i love that and you know as a sisterhoods we say we will find new and creative ways to spread joy and um, there's nothing like thinking on your feet. So congratulations. Thanks. And the other thing that has kind of made me aware of is that I don't really have to live here to work in my job. Like I, for the first time in my 35 years that I've lived in San Francisco, I'm like, hmm, I don't really have to stay here. Now it's just made me realize I can kind of work from anywhere. Wow. Okay, so over um, this week, have you made any personal um, negative or positive discoveries? About myself or just in general? Uh, you know, we'll leave it vague. <laughs> well, the whole experience actually has kind of made me admit how much of a homebody I am. I <laughs> have to say, I'm really comfy right here in my little bubble with my camera and reaching my, my virtual world and seeing my friends on FaceTime and just spending time with my cats and watching trash TV and working from home. I am surprised because I mean, I have been out there for years, girl. I mean, I was always that, that queen you could count on to show up, always. 
So it's been a really huge adjustment, but I'm kind of just like going, hmm. I mean, I'm not wearing shoes right now, are you? No, I'm not wearing underwear. <laughs> no, right, exactly. Like it's just been so, it's so much more comfortable and it's so much easier. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried that when it's over and I don't have an excuse, they'll be like, girl, come to my show. And I'm all like, okay. <laughs> I mean, that being said, though, there are so many entertainers that have come to this platform, but it's, I think, you know, I've seen you everywhere since quarantine has started. So it's just shifted. You know, that energy still exists, but now it's, how do we, how do we keep presenting? Right. Yeah. I've, I've been doing these charity fundraisers, things online. I actually have produced a show that's happening later today on uh, Falcon N uh, Naked Swords website, uh, Naked Swords slash Weekends, and also on Twitch TV slash Falcon Naked Sword. And it's a drag show fundraiser starring the, some of the hottest boys in gay porn who are drag queens. That are also drag queens or they're doing it like drag for the first time? Some of them are professional drag queens. So they're really, they're coming out and they're showing the world who they are. And some of them are sort of dabbling in it for the first time, but they're all really, really good. And it's a fundraiser for pineapplesupport.org, which is an organization that provides free and subsidized mental health services to the adult industry. So I'm really passionate about it. That's so important. Um, so will our viewers who are going to be watching this on Friday, will there be a rebroadcast link that we can share with them? Yes, our plan is to record it and to present it on nakedsword.com. So go look for it on Naked Sword. Fabulous. Be prepared. It's an adult site. Warning, warning, 18 over only. Okay, so what does community mean to you and how do you generate or make or foster community? Community means so many different things. And sometimes I think it's a word that people overuse. You know, I have, you can belong to many communities, you can build your own community. And basically to me, it's just finding your tribe, your network, a group of people that you can relate to that nurtures you and you give back to it's a it's a sense of belonging and quite often you find yourself in a community that is underserved and needs help so I identify with a lot of those communities I sort of work my way into a lot of I mean I belong to I feel like I belong to a lot of different communities and it's just people who share similar interests and passions and believe the same things that I do. In other words, people who are always right and on the right side of every issue. Like you, sister. Oh. Isn't it hard to be right all the time? It's exhausting, bitch. It is. And to be just. <laughs> I know. And to be beautiful. Well, I don't know about that, but... Oh, yeah, you do. Look at you. You're gorgeous. And to be modest at the same time. It's also hard. Do you get, do people tell you that you look like detox a lot? I, you know, I have gotten that. And when I started um, seven or eight years ago, detox came to Provincetown and one of my glitter mates showed her a picture of me and she recorded a video where she was like, sister light of Christ, I will find you in, you in the night and I will kill you. And I was like, ah! <laughs> I love her so much. I get that a lot. It's, it's, it, whenever I like come onto a, a platform and something that goes semi-viral, somebody who has no fucking clue on who I am, we're like, oh my God, I thought it was detox or it's detox in 20 years. So <laughs> I think it's a huge compliment. I think she's gorgeous. I think you'd be, because we have that same, it's that, you know, longer narrow face with the nice nose. I mean, that's right. Hello. I, I've never identified more with every version of A Star is Born. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, I think the Detox is a good queen to be compared to, though, because she's super talented. She's gorgeous. She is so cool. She's so much fun. She's really nice. Um, I think the comparison stops when they see what I'm wearing compared to, you know, because she is quite the fashion, fashionista. High fashion. Yeah. Okay. So, Roma, how long have you been a sister? 33 years. 
<laughs> Did you just go? <laughs> um, yeah, I know, girl. More than half my life, bitch. Crazy. Why is this important to you? <sighs> so when I first met the sisters, I had been living in San Francisco for just about two years. And I had, I had no idea that they even existed. I was sort of like a gay kid in a gay candy store. I came from Grand Rapids, Michigan, which was very conservative, even more conservative then than it is now. A very Christian reformed, you know, very whatever. So I always knew that I wanted to live somewhere else, in a city, like from a very, very young age. And um, I landed in San Francisco and I just lived the gay dream, you know, and then one day I was hanging out with friends at the Midnight Sun, which is a bar in the Castro, a video bar, and the, the door just flew open and in walked this creature that I had never seen anything like her. She looked like a clown showgirl nun. And she knew everybody by name and she was smiling and like she had the whole entire place eating out of the palm of her fucking hand. The bartender just handed her a drink and bowed. You know, I was like, what? My friends and I were like, what is this? And she walked up and she goes, hi, Michael, which is my birth name. And I was like, do I know you? And she goes, it's me, Norman. I go, what are you doing? Because Norman had been a, long, a friend of mine for like over a year. He was a bartender at the skate bar in the Fillmore. And we used to get go, we were drinking buddies. We would bring guys home, have three ways. Like we were all crazy, crazy. And um, I, he goes, I'm Sister Luscious Lashes. And I... I didn't know what that meant. And then he introduced me to the sisters and I learned about the impact that the sisters had in the community around HIV and AIDS at the very beginning and the way that they were creating such a firestorm in the media. Like whenever Dan Rather came to town or you know any big reporter or news story, they always had to come see what the sisters were doing and it was always front page news. And the communities that they served and the work that they did were so new to me i didn't realize that i really cared or that i had any kind of activist blood in me you know i, I grew up catholic i went to a, a catholic college and i never i was very active in student government so i've always been kind of out there i did theater and stuff like that but i never did anything like volunteer work you know i was never spiritually motivated to do any kind of hocus pocus catholic you know shenanigans and uh, <laughs> but then when i met the sisters it, tr it totally changed my life and it just awakened a whole new side of me that I didn't realize I had, that I really cared about people and I wanted to go out and demand the rights that are already mine, not asking for rights. Like I, I kind of had an assimilation sort of point of view before, like, I, well, you know, I'm gay, but I'm just like everybody else. And then I was like, I'm not like everybody else. And I don't have to ask you for my rights, they're mine and I demand them. You know, that's what the sisters taught me. And then also the, the compassion and the, the work around HIV and AIDS was just life-changing for me. Yep. <laughs> um. so, admit, so, I mean, I guess you asked me, what does it mean to me? I mean, when I first started, it was just sort of like a, uh, it was fun and it was shocking and it was new. And um, then I got down and started doing the work and I just really felt passionate about it. And in the last three decades, there's always been a new reason to keep doing the work and to get involved. You know, there's always a reason. There's the, the right to marry, the right to serve, all the, the equal rights in every aspect, but also the health issues and the medications and HIV AIDS and then LGBT youth and the homeless youth. And then you turn around and here comes the trans community who I fucking love. And, you know, I'm like, oh, my God, we got to get, you know, they need, they deserve these rights. They're their rights, you know, and you start fighting for the trans community. And then you're like, wait a minute, there's people of color in our community who are being underserved and underrepresented. I'm not having it, bitch. You know, like I just, there's always, always a reason for the sisters. We're going to be here forever. That's, that is true. And, you know, and even now in Boston, there's uh, a movement to, uh, decorporatize pride to get pride back um, into communities that are lesser served, communities that haven't seen a gay pride parade, and to get them out of. We don't have to march through 
you know, past, you know, the bank of whatever building. We can just, we can just be and perhaps meet in a baseball diamond. So there's, there's always a, a cause to champion. Right. Well, that's very interesting because that is a common scream of every year. You know, I worked very hard to get Facebook banned from Pride in 2014 when they started fucking with our names on online. But there's always been a real push to decorporatize and pull out these corporate sponsors. We really need to see 600 Google employees. You know, you, you feel like these companies are pandering to our community and they're, they pull out their gay pride flags and they put their gay, you know, groups in front of everybody for, for a month. And, and you're like, get the fuck out of our parade. The parade was a riot. You know, it's all started as a, and so people want to get back to that. And this year, because of the pandemic, San Francisco Pride went virtual and canceled their parade. But my really good friends, Juanita Moore and Alex Yuin, who are two amazing leaders in our community, organized the People's March. And they took it out of the financial district. It didn't march down the middle of Market Street past whatever bank building. It started at the original site of the very first protest. And it was amazing. It, it, you know, I talked to Juanita and she said it felt like pride. It was just, it was community, it was people. And of course it elevated black and brown voices and faces and put them in the front. And there were, they, cause a lot of people don't feel safe with the police and they don't feel included in an event where if, like, if you have to pay a cover charge to get into a celebration area, I mean, it's just, you can't, they, you know, they can't. So I was so proud of them. And even though I, I told Alex, I go, well, girl, you know, I said, probably even if, if I wasn't hosting part, I probably wouldn't go because of COVID. And then the closer it got, I was like, oh, I wanted to be there so bad. I would have put a mask on and risked it, you know, because you, you make choices. I mean, I'm, you got to be really safe, but I, I, I would have loved to have been there. It was mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, Boston. So we had a uh, transgender organized march that happened in a, uh, a neighborhood of color, and then it marched to uh, the police precinct, so maybe two or, two or four miles. Um, I think a, a march that those neighborhoods have never seen. And I saw, first of all, I got to appreciate a neighborhood that I really had only driven through, and I saw so much beauty, and there were folks, like 70 year old folks leaning out of the third story window of their apartment, some crying, some smiling, others with their camera phones out. And I was like, oh, this reminds me of 10 years ago when we marched for Massachusetts' right for marriage equality. And just people, you could feel that, that electric change in the air. Right. That's one of the things that is so special about being a sister. We get to experience those things and we get to feel it in such a real way because we bring an element to those events that we bring color, we bring joy. And, you know, we bring a certain gravitas sometimes. People are like, oh, the sisters are here. Like, you know, it, it can be considered a big deal when they see us because they know it's legit. And it's, it's an honor to march with women and to march with trans people and to march with black people and to stand beside them or behind them and let them take the lead on their issues. Yes. Oh. So I think that there is a moment, multiple moments actually, when this journey that we're collectively on, you and I, changes you. So do you have at least uh, at least one uh, memory or experience that comes to mind when being a part of the sisters changed the course of your life or changed something about you? Yeah, you know, I, I jumped on board and just started running with it. And it was a lot of it had to do with the party for me. Like I hosted nightclubs in drag. A lot of people will tell you that I'm one of the first sisters that they ever met, including some of the sisters in San Francisco now, because I was so out there. It didn't take me long to start hosting nightclubs, writing a column in San Francisco, hosting, I hosted San Francisco Pride in the 90s. I hosted Folsom Street Fair, like I was like out there, spreading the, the, me the message and the mission and raising awareness to the sisters. 
But it wasn't until we went to the March on Washington in 94, when CNN actually followed us on the plane and filmed the whole thing, it was freaking unreal. But that wasn't the, 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 the reason that it really changed my life is because I realized that um, there was a, a storm coming, you know, but there was a big change coming in the nation and the sisters had always been in the forefront of that fight. And we, I felt such a sense of community with my sisters. I felt such a sense of, um, with the community at large, they really loved having us there. It was the most unique and exciting experience I can ever imagine. And you know, at the time, there really weren't that many like freaks or drag queens there. I remember the first day we got there, a couple of sisters and I were like, girl, are we going to get in face and just go out and walk around? And some sisters were like, oh, no, I'm going to save my energy. And you know, me, I was all like, fuck yes, bitch, we're here. Let's go. So <laughs> we just got in nun drag and we went out into the the like the common one of the squares in DC and people just started swarming to us I mean they, they started out it was almost it was like when we went to Shanghai that was another life-changing experience but it was like it started out with like 25 or 50 people and then it was 100 and then all of a sudden it was like a thousand people were just like oh you know this what are these people who are they these are the you know it was in the 90s so it was just a really different life-changing experience and that's when i realized that i was part of something really big um this is an important question for me personally uh how do you sustain and how have how have you sustained over these 33 years oh well i am addicted to attention and coffee so I get plenty of both. <laughs> no, I, you know, it's, there was a period in my sisterhood when I stopped going to meetings because I felt like there was just so much negativity in the order. And I sort of went rogue and continued to do my work. And in my mind, I was always respectful to the sisters that came before me. And I tried to be the best me that I could be. And I continued to do the work and I would show up for sister events sometimes. Um, and I just, I just didn't feel like it was a good thing for me to go to meeting. Um, but I continued to love my work. And I think that the sisters actually saved my life. Um, I was addicted to crystal meth for a long time. And that probably has something to do with the negativity that I was feeling at these meetings. And also I probably just didn't wanna fucking go cause I was like, hi. So um, I believe though that my work with the sisters and my commitment to the order kept me focused because it's really easy when you when you do any kind of drugs but especially crystal meth it can consume you like you lose your soul you lose your teeth you lose your mind you, you know you everything but you can lose your soul and luckily i held on to the sisters and roma and it kept it gave me a purpose i wasn't perfect i was late all the time it was notorious you know people would knew that um but the sisters saved my life and I, I just can't imagine not being Roma. The opportunities and the, the work that, that we, the opportunities is provided, but then the, the relationships and the work that I've got to do are like, I mean, you can't really describe it, you know? It's just, you, you get it because you're a sister, but trying to explain to people this, how unreal it is. I mean, there's just <laughs> these things that happen and you're like, is this my life right now, you know? About maybe four or five years ago, um, the it's a mantra that I carry with me. It's not really a mantra. It's an awakening. And it was the moment that I realized that the universe is listening. And every morning I wake up, since the sisters changed me to be what I think is a better person, and I say, this is what I can offer today. Maybe it's not the same amount that I could offer yesterday. Maybe it's more... Maybe I'm crabby and I'm just going to try to be nice, but this is what I can bring to the table. And then the universe, like Serena Williams, hit that ball right back to me at light speed. And it was this, just this abundance that came back that I was like, oh, you are an infinite source of energy, aware that energy is being put out to, to do good. And so 
yeah, these these pathways just open up. Yeah, well, that you they've touched on something that's so true. And I've said this many times to many people. You give what you can, like you said, but every little like dollop of personal energy or love or joy or work that you put out there comes back to you a hundred times. It's just overwhelming sometimes, you know, when you go out and people are just, you just see their faces light up and they show you so much love and appreciation. And you're like, you know, you just feel like you're doing what you know you need to do. You know, it's like, I'm not doing anything great. I'm just here because this is important and I love you guys, you know, but they're, they, they just comes back and it nourishes you. So I think sometimes, you know, if you need to take a break for sure, take it like you have, if you can't fake this. You, I, I have had times where I'm like, oh my fucking God, why did I say yes to this? Like, it's the last thing I want to do. But I made a commitment. So like, I will get there. And the minute you get there, all that starts to happen. And you're like, oh, okay. This is, this is why I said yes. I'm so glad I'm here. Like, you know, I, I've hardly had any times where I've been like, oh, I should have fucking stayed home. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> but you have to, you have to, you have to find it because you, you can't fake it. Sisters, I have always said, I think sisters are born, not made. I know that there's a process you go through. There's training, there's learning curves, there's events that you have to plan. There's, you, you get, um, you find a sponsor and they nurture you and help, help you navigate the waters of joining the sisters and working in the community. But it has to be at the core of your being which is what I think is really cool about Cause when, like when I first found the sisters, I came in through Norman who was my really good friend. And that was the only way you could join the sisters then. Cause there was like five sisters in San Francisco. There were some sisters in Sydney and that's a couple of far flung nuns here and there. And that was it, you know? So it was very different. Like they didn't recruit and people didn't just come to them. Oh, I saw your website. Cause like who had a website? It was, it was, you just had friends and then you invited your friends to join. And that's still really how it is. People answer a calling, whether they do find us through a website or on Twitter, or they come in through friends, they have to feel that calling. That's so, that's so true. Um, so how long, speaking of, I guess, a calling, um, how long have you been sober? Oh, so I quit using speed almost as long as like 14 years ago. So I used it for about that long and now I've been off it for that long. So <laughs> God for that. I had gotten really, I wasn't taking care of myself. Everything was sort of just in a bad place. And um, I, was, I was over it. You know, I just, I really honestly was just over it. I was sort of doing it out of habit because the people that I hung out with still did it. And it was just something that after so many years, it was sort of just like, and um I had an incident where I actually, I was almost 300 pounds. I know. <laughs> so, like somebody just shoved something up your butt, you're all. Um, so, and I, you know, my skin was horrible. I just, I was in bad, bad shape. And I went to work early in the morning and I walked up the stairs to the office. And as was the case normally for me at that point in my life, whenever I exerted myself and walked up hills or stairs, I would have to stop because I would feel like I was gonna pass out. Like I was gonna perhaps black out because I had no circulation and no oxygen. At the time I wasn't aware of what was really going on. But this time I went, made it into the bathroom at work and just the lights went out and I just fell. And I sprained my ankle. I, it could have been worse girl, I could have died. I could have hit my head on the sink and been like, see ya. You know, so. I, I hobbled to my desk and I sat there all morning. And then when it was time to go to work, my friends were like, well, you know, where should we go? And I, was, I stood up and I started limping. They're like, what happened? And I'm all, oh, I fell. You know, I didn't want to say anything. And finally they got it out of me. And I told them, I said, I passed out in the bathroom. And my boss, Stephen Scarborough, called me in his office. And he's all like, taking you to the hospital. And that he's been a friend. He was a friend of mine for years. He's been with my boss for years. We're still very, very close. And um, he and his partner, Brent, took me to the hospital and I got the full work over and I had a blood clot. So, I mean, they literally saved my life. And then that's when I was like, okay, the party's over, bitch. You need to put that shit down. Because I was sort of waiting for a sign. Like when you're, sometimes when you're so in your addiction, yeah, I was, I loved it. 
Oh, don't get it twisted, girl. I was a huge fan. Like, I had a lot of fun on that shit. And um, I was just waiting for the world to tell me what people would say about how dangerous it was or how bad it was for you. And, and it did. The world set me on the right path. And then shortly after that, Brent was like, we're joining a gym. And I was all, what? I would never go to a gym, ever. Like, I can't. So we go to Gold's Gym in Soma and we're sitting in the office and like, I'm about to sign it. I told the guy, I'm like, you know, I'm only going to cruise the steam room and take and use a sun tanning bed, right? He goes, got it. I go, okay, just so we're clear. So <laughs> he signed the thing and I, but I didn't, I really took to it. I started doing the treadmill and, and doing a lot of cardio and the weight started to come off. And, you know, once you lose like 20, 30 pounds and people start to notice it, you know, then they start commenting on it and I'm the vainest bitch alive. It, you know, no surprise, everybody knows that. So you get a couple of compliments and you're like, oh, okay, I'm into it. And it was like, I had a whole new community to, you know, engage in and to win over and to become a part of. So the gym and, and those, Brent and Steven really saved my life. Yeah, so don't use crystal, kids. Just don't do it. It's so nasty. Yeah. Bad for you. Bad. Bad, bad. So uh, this is a double question. Um, what was your first... Because I believe that failures are not bad. I believe failures teach us. So what was your first or worst failure as an art director? And as a sister, that's that's a very healthy attitude. That's that's a really good attitude to have because failure is inevitable. Nobody is perfect, and failure can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Uh, sometimes we're our own worst critics. I think most of the time we're our own worst critics, so we tend to beat ourselves up. And it's like you know what? Give yourself a break. I mean, come on. But. Um, one thing that I did do when I was using Crystal and I was a sister, I was invited to speak at GLAD. I, I mean, um, PFLAG. And I was really, really excited about it. I, I was looking forward to it. I love that organization. And it was a huge honor to be invited to speak to this huge regional like meeting of all these people. And we, they kept, they were on me about it. We were set in stone, bitch. And I, I didn't do it. I, I think I had some boy over, I had drugs, I was like not in the, in the place and I just blew it off. And that was, you know, 30, how many years ago was that? 20 years ago, longer, 25 years ago. And it, that really still really bothers me. I really, I'm disappointed in myself for that. I, I missed a great opportunity. You know, so that's just one example of, of making de bad decisions or being in a bad place sometimes. Um, you know, I had a lot, girl, I've been doing this for three decades. So there have been times where I've been at a, like speaking at a college or university and, uh, most of these happened around like in the first five to seven years of my sisterhood, because it's a learning process. And, um, one of my favorite things to do is to go to colleges and universities and talk to human sexuality classes. And now they have LGBT studies, you know, and I'm like, it's great. But I went to this class and I was just young and sassy and I blurted out, I think I'm a black woman trapped in a man's body. And they were all just like, even, you know, 25 years ago, that did not go over well, girl. And they were like, what do you mean? And I go, well, you know, like the way they talk and I can relate to their, their experience. I feel like a black woman. And they were, how can you relate to a culture that you're not a part of. How can you be, a, you know, like they were trying to, they educated me that day hardcore. And it was something that I still look back on and just shudder when I think about how, how naive and embarrassing, what a thing to say, you know. I don't remember what college it was. I don't remember what year it was. I don't even remember what other sisters were there, but I'll never forget that lesson that I learned that day, you know. But I've, as an art director, I have never made any mistakes. Thank no. you for as, as is evident by the long, long history that Naked Sword has had in, in our community. Did I get that name right? You sure did. Girl, don't act like you don't know. Come on. <laughs> so on the flip side, um, 
How about um, a success? Um, maybe your first success or your your best success to date um, as a sister? Well, again, many, many years ago, I was invited to speak at a press conference at City Hall for Scouting for All. How, right, I mean, how random is that? But there was this young boy who was, who was not gay himself, but he and his family were starting a petition to allow the Boy Scouts to, to, to force the Boy Scouts to allow LGBT gay people into the organization. And it was a huge issue. It got major, major press. And I really, really worked hard on the presentation that I was gonna give and I was so nervous. And I went up there and I, I read my speech and I talked about how, you know, I am not a typical representation of what a gay person looks like, but I do know what it feels like to be discriminated against. And, you know, I had this, it was a good speech, Carl, it was so good. And um, after I gave it, I got down and Tom Emiano, who is somebody that I, is a personal hero of mine. He is a legislator. Uh, he was on the school board. He was on the board of supervisors. He's like a San Francisco icon and a hero. Told me that I did a really good job. And I, that is still something that I'm so proud of <laughs> that he complimented me like that. You know, so I mean, you, you rise, sometimes you rise to the occasion and sometimes you don't, but, um, other things that I guess I would consider a success. Oh, well, you know, I started the Stop the Violence campaign, which is that, <laughs> that little thing that's been going on since 1989. Um, there had been a real spike in hate crimes in uh, the parks and around San Francisco, the Castro. And um, I was just pissed off about it. And I remember growing up, there was this group, they had a block mother program and they used to have signs in the window where they had a hand and it said, if, you, you know, if you're being bullied or harassed or you need help, this is a safe place. Did you ever see those at all? I mean, I'm older than you, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, I was like, we need to have a safe way for people to signify safe places for us to go if we're being attacked or something. So I sat down at my little Mac SE30 or whatever the hell it was and designed the, took the pink triangle and put stop the violence on it and um, start, did a film to public service announcement to raise awareness to the, the rise in hate crimes and to let people know that they were gonna see these signs in houses and windows and there would be a place for them to go. And um, it just sort of had a life of its own after that. I mean, I realized pretty quickly that in San Francisco, you live in these high rise <laughs> or even these, these um, buildings that have gates so you don't really have necessarily a window that even faces the street or a way for people to get to you so you know it wasn't the perfect thing but we convinced businesses to put them up to signify themselves as a safe place and then we added the whistle distribution to it so we took it all over we went to college campuses and all over the mission and really really did a lot with that campaign and it was super important to me i was really committed to it and then after a while other issues came and sisters came and went who were involved with me in it. And we just sort of like, it just sort of went, you know, dark for a while. Like we didn't really do much with it. And then one pink Saturday, a young black man named Stephen Powell. I'm sorry. Was shot and killed at our pink Saturday celebration by people from outside the community. And that was so devastating to the sisters and me that I knew um, it was time to bring that campaign back. And that's when it really got a whole new life. We partnered with the San Francisco Police Department and the Castro Community on Patrol and <clears throat> really amped it up. And we've been doing it pretty solidly ever since. And that has just been like another 15, God, when was Stephen? <sighs> We've been doing it well pretty much since it started, but yeah, that was a real pivotal life-changing moment for me. So Roma, back to your secular life as Michael. How did you find a job art directing for porn? <laughs> well, my best friend of over 25 years, Michael Ewens, AKA Shantae Bouvier, worked for Falcon Studios. I was in the, I was hosting a nightclub at 1015 Folsom and Shante had just moved to town. The studio moved her here 
to work in customer service and she was up against the wall. She was dressed like Wonder Woman, but I thought she looked more like Mama Leone. And, <laughs> you know, I walked by and I was like, get it girl, like, you know, go Wonder Woman like this or whatever. And we just started talking and we just became really good friends. And we just sort of started hanging out. And before I knew it, he was one of my really, really good friends. And he introduced me to Shishi LaRue and Steven Scarborough and a lot of porn stars and a lot of people in the industry. And I was a graphic artist doing freelance work and I had a magazine, so I needed covers for the magazine and nothing will make a gay rag pick up off the streets faster than if it has a hot guy on it. So I went to Steven Scarborough at Hot House and I was like, can I use some of your images for our magazine? And he was all like, sure. And then I started doing freelance graphics for him. And then he brought me into the art department and shortly after that, we moved to a new office and things really started to pick up. We got real busy and he made me the art director for Hot House. And then I just started doing the Tim and Roma show with Tim Valenti at Naked Sword. So we were friends who did this crazy, stupid talk show. And um, when Falcon assumed Naked Sword, they all came to be conglomerated. They bought Hot House. And one of the stipulations was that I got to go work for, with Tim at Falcon Naked Sword. So I was saved <laughs> by that grace of God. So I was the art director for that company now, and now I've been made creative director. So it was through friendships and just being out there and appreciation for the industry. I've always been a huge porn fan. Like I loved it. I watched it nonstop. What scares you? Um. <sighs> Well, right now, white people, white people who don't wear masks, white people who, who believe that they can, they can push their Bible and their flag and get away with whatever they want. I've always said that, though. I've always felt a much more in danger around fucking white people. Like, you know, and I'm white. I'm the whitest. Don't get it twisted. And I, you know, I, there were a lot of things to be proud of, but these people, they are not, not it, girl, not the look, honey. Um, you know, I'm not really afraid of, of coronavirus and COVID-19, although it would probably kill me because of my pre-existing conditions, but I feel like I am taking all the precautions necessary and I don't intend to get it. I mean, you can avoid it. You know, it's, if you, the more careful you are, the better. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not really afraid of death, but I am, I just hope that there is a way to keep tabs because I'm really nosy and super curious and I want to know what happens next, right? You just want to know because this has been a crazy history and I want to see, I want to see what happens to my friends after I'm gone and I want to see what happens to the next generation of queer people and I want to see what kind of world they grow up in I want to see what happens you know that's just I think there is a way though I think I, I believe that when you die there's, there's something happens that no one can even fathom like you can't even wrap your head around it there's it's just going to be something that you're like wow I didn't see this coming <laughs> you know I just, but I don't believe it's going to be over I really don't. Well, I think it's all part of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy. So energy has to go somewhere. Who, I mean, I don't know what that is. Maybe we make a nice plant. I don't know, but. Well, as long as I can figure out, see what's going on. I mean, I, I love technology. I am a super like geeky fan of all this. And I just, I, you know, I, I've got to know what the next gadget is, girl. I hope I can get my hands on one wherever I am. So the most macabre thing I've ever thought about is the sacred clown jewels. And they can take your remains and compress them into stones. And I feel like every house should do that with their sisters and then make, like, brooches and jewelry. And then you're like, you're still sistering. I love that. They can do that. You're right. I've seen that. Oh, I'm totally going to do that. Right? I mean, why not? What's one thing that people don't know about the porn industry? 
Oh. Um, it's really not as sexy as some people probably think it is. It's a hardcore business. It's very competitive. And there are spreadsheets and there are meetings and there are regulations and rules and it's it's a lot of work. It really is. You know, we we have great people who work in the in the porn industry. There are a lot of really passionate, interesting, uh, sexy, fun people. A lot of quirky people. A lot of extra extra people. Uh, a lot of the guys are just amazing people. Like they're really sweet. And it takes a special person to be able to do it. You, know, you have to be an exhibitionist. You have to have confidence. You have to have thick skin today with social media and stuff. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people probably assume that it's a lot sexier than it really is. Mm. But. Well, I think I remember telling you, um, we got to, uh, I had the privilege of hanging out uh, with you at Purdue when Sister Purdue pulled us over uh, to speak to her college. At I was that when I was getting ready, how much fun we had at that. Remember that breakfast she made? Oh, girl, that bacon. <laughs> that Indiana bacon, I'm so over it. I need it right now. But it's like, if we're already doing these things and we're enjoying them in the privacy of our own home, and especially if it's a specialty thing, you know, it's like, I'm not talking about bacon, although there's porn for that. It's like, if you're already doing the thing, you might as well package it and send it out to other people who might think that they're alone, right? Porn is just public service saying, Oh, you like getting peed on? Don't worry. Somebody else does too. Yeah. No, it's, I've always looked at it that way because I see the mail that comes in. I mean, back in the day, people used to hand, some people still do handwrite letters, but you also hear the customer service phone calls and the emails that people send. And it helps so many people, so many people who are isolated, who are closeted, who, like you said, think they're a freak because they like pissed. You know, it's like, oh, honey. <laughs> yeah. I, I I actually do reply to a lot of emails. They're like, send it to Roma because I'm like, honey, you know, like I just break it down because I don't want anybody to feel any kind of way. Like you are you are entitled to whatever turns you on and embrace it and let's bring it to the Folsom Street Fair and show it off and like enjoy yourself. Sex mm -hmm. is wonderful and it shouldn't be denied anybody. That's right. So what's something that people don't know about being a sister? Well, I could say the same thing about meetings and <laughs> um, I, maybe they don't know how, uh, well, it's expensive. I mean, it can be, you know, if you, a lot of sisters spend a lot of money on makeup and jewelry and clothing. Um, and we're 100% volunteer, so don't get it twisted. There's never been a paid person on staff. We, you know, our organization is volunteer-based. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been doing it for so long. What do you think people don't know? What do you, th what do you think are some misconceptions people have? I mean, I think that, well, for me, so there's, you know, there's at least 10 different types of sisters, if not more. And by that, I mean, there's the, there's the, like the witch sisters, there's the religious sisters, there's the sisters that keep spreadsheets. But uh, for me, I feel everything. I got, I once got to, um, as I said earlier, I'm in um, entertainment design. I was, I'm a lighting designer. So I got to, as a side gig, run Spotlight for Carrie Fisher when she came through with Wishful Drinking. And there was a, there was a, like a glip in the show and they had to stop the show and she crawled out from under the curtain because they dropped it on her and she went, she went, folks, folks, I need you not to be mad at me because I feel all of this and I'll take it home with me tonight. She's like, so let me just do a little tap dance and then just we'll reschedule, but I'm so sorry. And um, like in that gravelly voice that she has. And, um, you know, for me, the, the best gift that I've been able to give to other sisters, which I think is something that people don't know, is that some of us feel, we can feel when somebody is upset, I'll go over, I'll talk to them, and then I'll allow whatever they're feeling 
to move through me. And then I let it, I let it leave me. But I've seen other sis younger sisters, like novices that don't know how to ground. And they'll leave an encounter and they'll just be, their whole mood will have changed. And I'm like, hold up, you're holding on to this. Like, let it, let it move through you, expiate that, but don't, don't take it. So I think, I don't know if people know that underneath all of the character and the clown and the makeup and the costume is somebody that feels. Right, yeah, that's a really good point. It's a very good point. So true. Yeah, we, we, we're, we're not just clowning around. We really do. I believe that is a common thread of the sisters. We really care. We really care, yeah. So what's something that people don't know about you? Ooh. Um, I've never seen a Star Wars movie. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm pretty open. Star Wars. I'm an adopt, I was adopted. Really? Yeah, sure was from a Catholic adoption agency. So I was basically raised by nuns from a, when I was an infant, but I was adopted as like a three month old baby. But yeah, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're reaching the end. We've got, we have about three more questions and then a small series of rapid fire. Um, so if you had to give a piece of advice to somebody, um, you know, either a sister or somebody who's starting um, in the industry, in the, in, in the adult entertainment industry, what is a piece of advice that you would give? Well, I'm gonna focus on the sisters. Um, I think that, actually it sort of applies to both. I've always felt like there was a real connection between drag queens and porn stars. There's a definitely, there's like a lot of this, but, um, it's something that people don't know about sisters is a lot of us, they think that we're, we're such extroverts and we're really bravado and we clearly are like have tons of confidence, but we're just as, as insecure and often unsure as everybody else. We don't always enter every situation 100% confident that we're going to be welcome there, that we're going to do the right thing, we're going to say the right thing. We don't know anymore that how we're going to be received. Um, but the thing that I try to, to tell people, and I think this is really important, is... Um, I can dress like this, okay, and I can walk down the street and then this corner to this corner, right, and get the whole entire gamut of reactions from like, freak, faggot, you know, what the fuck are you supposed to be? Is it Halloween? You know, to, oh, oh, hi, I love your makeup, you know, to, oh, sister, how are you? To like, Roma, you know, I love you. And from this corner to this corner, I have not changed. So the important thing to realize is that what people say about you and how they perceive you says a lot more about them than it does about you. And that's something I really want young people to remember, especially in these times of social media and bullying, something that we're always trying to encourage young people to remember is that when people say these things about you, they don't know you, they're reacting to who they may think you are, but it says a lot more about them than it does about you. That's really important. That's, I think, um, you know, I remember people saying that to me or around me. There's a moment where that clicks in your being and that moment you become impenetrable in, yeah. in a way. You know, your shell hardens and that's, that's so magical. But you have to, um, no matter how many times you hear it, you have to believe it, right? You have to love yourself. Yep. And I used to think that Whitney Houston song was just the greatest love of all of loving yourself. I was like, how vain now? Not realizing that I was doing it. I was so lucky to be raised uh, by a super supportive mom and a really loving family. Um, I had great friends in high school, but I was always 100% myself. I was very feminine. I didn't even realize it. Most of the time I was just being who I am. And when, it, when you reach a certain age and people start to point it out and they're all sometimes not so nice, I always just had this attitude and I think it's because of my wonderful mother. Like, fuck you, you have a problem with me, it's your problem. Like, I don't really give a fuck what you think of me, you know? And you have to have a certain amount of that, you really do. You like that thick skin that you said, you know, especially if you're gonna be a sister, you have to be confident. 
Because you know you're doing the right thing. You know what your motivation is. Don't listen to them. What's a common myth about Roma? Uh, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people probably think that I'm a total media whore and that I am a, a, in it for fame and for other things. And there's a certain extent of that that's true. I mean, I do enjoy that. Like yesterday, I went down to the waterfront in a mask and glasses and somebody recognized me. I was like, oh, hi. You know, like, that's, I love that. I'm not going to lie. But um, <clears throat> like the, the, so, I, you know, I call myself the most photographed nun in the world. And it's like, oh, okay, easy girl, you know, really. But the story behind that is years ago when I hosted Folsom Street Fair, it was a really, really hot one. And I had been working all day on stage up and down, my feet hurt, I was super sweaty, my, I felt like my makeup was just like runny. I, I was over it, girl. And you know, the Folsom Street Fair, there's 300,000 people, so getting through that crowd is not easy. And people stopped me and they would ask me questions. They all, everybody was like, can I get a photo? Can I get a photo? And I was like, ugh. So I made it out of there and I went to my friend Jay's house and made it up to his apartment. I was like, ugh. I said, I am so over it. If one more person asks me for a fucking photo, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to scream. And he was all like, well, you better enjoy it because one day no one will. And I was like, Phew. I went, oh my God, I am such a cunt. I'm such an ungrateful cunt right now. Like it was just a, one of those moments when the universe shows you how you are behaving and you're like, so from that day forward, and I'm not kidding you, I vowed I would never say no to a photo. And I never have. And my friends won't even walk with me anymore when I'm out somewhere. Cause they're like, you have, you have to be, you get through here. You know, like only my best friend, again, the one who got me into porn, Shantae, is the only one who will be there and she'll push through people. But if somebody's like, can I have a photo? I'm like, Yes, like you know, it, people are like, "Fuck her, she's just doing her thing," and I'm all like, "I have to." So that's where that. Then I started thinking, you know, I've been doing this for thirty years. All the different mantles that your pictures on the Facebook profiles, the people, the people who take pictures you don't even know. I'm probably the most photographed nun in the world, so I trademarked it. Now it's, it's started saying it enough, and there you have it, girl. Create your own reality. So here are some, first of all, thank you. I love that story. I love that story so much. Um, I've got a few rapid fire questions for you. Um, boxers or briefs? Box, no, briefs, briefs. What am I saying? Ugh, I love briefs. Coffee or tea? Okay, wait, go ahead. Coffee or tea? Coffee. What brings you joy? Oh, life, laughter. Tears of joy is my favorite thing. I cry when I'm happy, more, way more than when I'm sad. Can't help it. Favorite flower? Oh, I like the Gerber daisies. Is that what they're called? Gerbera daisies? Mm -hmm. I love the brightly colored little round perfection. Favorite word? Fuck. It's so perfect, right? And it can be good or you know negative. Too. It can be good or bad. So. Right. It's so versatile. Yeah. I also like girl. I can't help it. <laughs> girl. And you can answer any question with it. What'd you think of that movie? Girl. You know, <laughs> or what, how was that meal? Girl. You know, like you, you can just the only word you need, really, depending on the inflection. How old are you? 57. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, best snack. I love cheese. I do. I love a good cheese stick. I love bacon, hot dogs, like anything low carb. Meat. I like meat. I love Stop. meat. Uh, yeah. Do you have a favorite work of art? I. I do have one thing that I really like. Do you want to see it? Yeah. Is it you? <laughs> of course, girl. <laughs> ha! 
It's Roma as a Simpson character. Can you see it? I can't. That's I'm not amazing. Watching. Right? Bill Morrison drew it for me. I just, I fucking love it. And I'm not even that big a Simpsons fan. But there she is. Uh, amazing and accurate. How did you get that portrait of detox? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite song? Um, I like anything from The Wiz, especially Home. I I love the and Dream Girls. I like I guess I like show tunes, but I like almost anything Keisha and Pink. Um, yeah, I like I like a lot of different kind of music. Really, is there a song of the week? Uh, uh, song of the week? Mm. No, I can't think of anything. That's okay. That's okay. Um, what color are your sheets? Uh, blue, like a pretty teal aqua blue. Uh, socks or no socks? Socks. Sandals or shoes? No, I do not like feet. Cover those nasty claws up, put socks on, don't let your toes hang over, your biscuits in the back, none of it. I like shoes and socks. Uh, favorite vegetable? Broccoli. Ooh, it is good. It is good. Uh, favorite dirty word? Fuck. Mm. How can people find out more about you? I'm on all social media at Sister Roma, um, you can follow me, reach out, please say hello. Especially if uh, sisters are watching this, I love to hear from sisters. It was always one of my objectives when more orders started popping up. You know, we went to the LA executor. We were there when Seattle had important anniversaries and events. And uh, it's always been one of my objectives to get to know sisters around the world. I've been lucky to go to Manchester and Sydney and travel quite a bit all over the United States to different houses and things. I've hosted investiture or uh, executors and other things. And I love to hear from sisters all over the place. I, it's interesting to me that there's so many of us out there who feel this calling. That's one of my favorite parts about um, being a part of this family is that at this point now, no matter no matter where I go, there is generally a sister there. And generally, we all tend to view the world the same way. You know, so I, I went to two, two or three years ago, the 49th anniversary, I got to stay with Loganberry Frost. And Loganberry was like, this is my refrigerator. Don't even ask me, just open it and take like, whatever is in there is yours. And I was like, and that's always been my mantra. When sisters come and visit me, I'm like, this is where the food is. I'll, I'll make something if you need to, but like, you know how to cook. So don't worry about it. Everything that you could need, mine is yours. And we all, I think, view this, the world similarly. similarly. So yeah. it's, you know, no it's, matter it's, 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 or, or, whether, you, whether you're in North Carolina or Paris, you're sitting down with a group of sisters and you feel at home. You're like, you recognize them. There's, you're like, oh, I know what sister, like you said, there's like 10 kinds of sisters. You're like, oh, I know what kind of sister, you know, like, but they're all different. They're all unique, but there's like a, there's a thread. There's like a personality type. It's like a, there's a familiarity. There's a, it's a sense of family wherever you go when you sit down with a group of sisters, in face or out of face. It's just, it feels familiar, which is really nice. Well, Sister Roma, I want to thank you for spending the last hour or so uh, with me and with our viewers and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I really, I really enjoyed it. I love you to death. I think you're amazing. I cannot wait to see you in person. Who knows where we'll meet up next, girl. We'll have some bacon. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing you in the flesh as well. I miss you so much. 
Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye.